We are six weeks early for Palm Sunday, but as we go through Luke's gospel, that's the spot where we're at in Luke chapter 19. You can call it Palm Sunday, waving the palms. You can call it triumphal entry as far as like being a parade. Uh, this is in uh, all four Gospels because the main parts of Jesus' life are in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all four times. Although Luke doesn't have the word palm in it. The other Gospels do, but of course that's what they were waving at Jesus from the other Gospels. And Luke adds some additional words that's not in the other Gospels. And the additional words will concern that Jesus was crying on the parade. So it's, uh, that's not in Matthew, not in Mark, not in, it's, it's here. So we will get to that section in a little bit. Jesus had left Galilee way back in Luke 9 and all the way through until Luke 19. He's not in Jerusalem yet. And now he enters the city. The first reading of that is Luke 19, verse 28. After he had said these things, the parable, he was going on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he approached Bethphage and Bethany, near the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, then that will be the part of uh, go find a donkey, but uh, we'll look at the uh, introduction. Going up to Jerusalem, that's been that way the whole time, always Jerusalem is up, doesn't matter what direction you go to. He went to Bethany. Now, not much here in Luke, but you might remember Gospel of John. He went to Bethany before the Last Supper, before the Passover. He had heard Lazarus had been sick, but he did not rush. Two days later, he got there. And uh, Martha and Mary, the sisters, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And he said to Martha, he will rise again on the last day. Uh, he will rise again. And she said on the last day, and he said, I am the resurrection, the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. So that's uh, verse 25, John 11, verse 26. And uh, all who live in me will never die. So one promise is about eventual bodily resurrection. The other promise is a person's soul or spirit lives on after death. They went out to the cave with a stone around it, and there were lots of witnesses where Jesus yelled, Lazarus, come forth. So that's right here in time. It's not here in the Gospel of Luke, but that's right here in time, and there's a big, long section of it in John chapter 11 and even some into chapter 12. And after many witnesses saw Lazarus come forth, these witnesses are going to be on the parade route. They're going to be yelling at Jesus and Lazarus in Palm Sunday after his own funeral. So that, that will affect how they are uh, praising him. They're praising him for who he is and what he's done in the past, but they're all also praising him for what he did at Bethany. Uh, not mentioned here, but calling Lazarus out of the tomb and uh, Lazarus right with them. So he gets to uh, the town opposite Jerusalem, Olivet. I always think of other places that have it. Michigan has an Olivet. It's by Battle Creek. I don't know if there's any. We have a Nazareth here, but I don't know whether we have an Olivet. Anyway, they get there, and he sent out two disciples, and they're going to go look for a donkey. Let's go ahead and read the last part of verse 29, then continuing. He sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you. There as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? You shall say, The Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And they were untying the, as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. 
They brought it to Jesus, and they threw their coats on the colt and put Jesus on it. As he was going, they were spreading their coats on the road. Well, uh, before we get to the donkey story, there are two important phrases. One gets repeated, the Lord has need of it. The Lord has need of it is in verse 31 and verse 34. Actually, in the fullest sense, uh, God doesn't need anything. If he has any need at all, it's because he withdrew his full ability to get something done. He pulled back and uh, then he uh, needs something to be done and gives people the choice as whether we will respond, get involved, or not. So God could do just fine without us ever helping and doing anything. He doesn't need us to uh, sing today. He doesn't need us to teach science school today. He could have done just fine without it. He deliberately withdrew a little bit so that we would have the blessings of doing his work. Uh, Bible way of saying it, we have the blessings of serving him. So God created the needs, and whatever he wants us to do, uh, do it. And uh, that's what uh, Mary, mother of Jesus, said at Cana. The uh, water pots had run out of wine, and he said, whatever he says to you, do it. John 2, 5. So if the Lord has a need, it's because he did it on purpose, and he wants us to work for him. Another interesting devotional phrase, verse 32, they found it just as he had told them. That happens several times in the Gospels, that phrase. They found it just as he had told them, referring to events in the life of Christ. Uh, To our lifespan now, we will find it just as God has taught. Regarding the future events, in the end, we will find it just as God has taught. All those teachings about uh, he's uh, going to come again and going to set up the uh, heavenly city and uh, going to have glorified bodies and going to co-rule forever. We will find it just as he taught us. So the Lord has need of it and we will find it as he has taught us. And they found the donkey just as he said. Colt here means a very young one called a donkey specifically in the parallels, Matthew 21 and John 12. Mark chapter 11 seems to have more details. Uh, You will find it tied by the door. You will find it outside on the street. Uh, Likely that the two men he sent that are unnamed is likely Peter and John. Um, A lot of people think Peter because of the way Mark adds all these details of what was being said, and Mark was Peter's assistant. So it's not called the uh, Gospel of Peter, but actually Mark is writing Peter's memories down. It's very specific. Uh, Immediately when you enter, you'll find a donkey. It was by the door. It was on the street. And so uh, likely Peter and John were the two that went, and Mark is giving Peter's memory and details. Uh, Other passage talking about waving the palms, and we'll get to that. Right now, you'll find a young donkey, and no one's ever ridden on it. I don't have any experience with uh, donkeys or horses, quite a bit with cows, but uh, not donkeys or horses. I would think that they have to be broken. Until they're broken, they're wild, and I would think it'd be a bad idea to get on an untrained donkey and go through a very noisy parade because as we go on, they'll be yelling at Jesus. So uh, Luke 19 has a fulfillment of prophecy, although he doesn't mention Zechariah 9, 9, that the king will come riding on a donkey. Luke doesn't mention it, but the other gospels do. Quoting Zechariah 9, 9, When you think of fulfilled prophecy, you think of some that are impossible to artificially fulfill, can't fake them. One of them is coming when he said, you don't know the day. It's very likely that one of the prophecies' days will run out right on Palm Sunday, and that's very specific uh, prophecy. Uh, This one be very difficult to artificially fulfill. 
very difficult to fake it. I get on a young donkey that's never been ridden, and I don't think that would work real well when you think of uh, miracles, maybe not quite in the miracle category, but pretty close to the impossible humanly category. So they're making all kinds of noise. Zechariah 9.9 predicted the king would come riding on a donkey that had never been ridden on. So it's actually an Old Testament prediction, a very difficult thing to artificially fulfill. The other Gospels talk about waving branches, some specifically palm branches. Now, we don't do that. We'll have a Christmas parade and a New Year's parade and a Fourth of July parade. And around here also we had a, usually a Veterans Day parade and nobody waves branches. Nobody waves sticks. Certainly nobody waves palm branches, but they don't. When do they do that in a parade? That really is kind of odd, but it's one of those things where it nicely fits the history of the times and nicely fits the culture. It wouldn't fit modern culture. It wouldn't fit the United States. It wouldn't fit anything in our generations, but it fits nicely the way they do it. The Jews were commanded by Moses to come to Jerusalem three times a year. Uh, they would come to Passover in the spring, to Pentecost in the summer. The third one was in the fall, tabernacles. Tabernacle means tent. And they were commemorating leaving the Exodus and the children of Israel uh, cross through the Red Sea and they have to live in these tents. Tents did have fabric. The Apostle Paul made tent fabric. But the fabric was draped over branches, and they were usually palm branches. So as odd as it is in our place and time to think about this custom, they would cut a lot of branches and make tents. Everybody was supposed to live in a hut in the fall. Not everybody in the spring at Passover, but there were, would be a couple of reasons to do so. Uh, first of all, somebody who didn't want to pay for a hotel, make a hut. Or the hotels were all full, just like Bethlehem at the tax time in the story of Jesus' birth. And maybe they get to Jerusalem and they're looking for an inn and there aren't any. But there would be these things like we have at Christmas where there are Christmas trees all over the place. They would have palm branches all over and uh, you could uh, make a tent and you get by. So it fits their culture. So it's kind of like this is historically true and it's kind of a weird thing, but it does show that this is uh, accurate in terms of the place and the times. But there is more. There was a custom where they would actually shake palm branches at the temple, and while they were doing that, they would sing Psalm 118. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So uh, we'll describe that uh, ceremony shortly, but let's read a little bit more of our Luke 19 account. We'll read uh, verse 37 and verse 38. As soon, he, as soon as he was approaching, near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen, shouting, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. That kind of sounds like Bethlehem also. Uh, Peace in heaven and glory in the highest, and they're yelling and they're shaking palm branches. Well, um, the oldest uh, version of uh, Jewish customs was written by Alfred Edersheim. Alfred Edersheim was a Jewish rabbi in Vienna, and then he converted to become a Christian. And although the Talmud was written in Hebrew, the best commentaries on it are written in German. So it's always been this way. The real experts on the Talmud can read German. 
and uh, that's been, been the case for a long time. And Alfred Edersheim talks about a, a festival they had at the Tabernacles. And uh, we will describe it uh, in general, not in detail. He actually gives what happens when and what happens next. And you have the priests all at the temple. You have the choir on the temple steps. And then you have the masses of people all around it. They've all gathered. They would sing, and among the verses they would sing would be verses from Isaiah 12 and, like here, verses from Psalm 118. In Isaiah 12, God is my salvation, I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord is the strength, my strength and my song he has become my salvation. You will draw joyfully from the wells of salvation. And the way that custom was, is they'd sing, you will draw joyfully from the wells of salvation. And people on top of the temple walls were pouring buckets of water down to make it uh, look like uh, God is showing us his water. And then they would uh, keep chanting, and they would chant Psalm 118. This part, but also more of it, which we also know, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And while they were singing at this point, they would say, save us, save us. In Hebrew, Hosanna. That means, Lord, please save us. That's what that means. Lord, please save us. Lord, please save us. And while they're singing this, they're shaking all these palm branches at the temple. And among the things they would say is, blessed is he who is coming in the name of the Lord. Well, Jesus had been at the fall feast. This is uh, spring here, but he had been there at the fall. And he said, on the last day, quote, the great day of the feast, still quoting John 7, Jesus stood and cried out, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. So the last time they actually did this ceremony, they're pouring out the water and they're singing, Let us drink from the wells of salvation. And Jesus is yelling, I am the well of salvation. Come to me. That was in the fall. In the spring, it seems like all the crowds are continuing and they're applying the whole ceremony to Jesus. Instead of waving the palm branches at the temple, they're now waving at Jesus. Instead of singing at the temple to God, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord and God, please save us. They're saying, Jesus, you please save us. And they're waving the palm branches at him. Uh, he is the living water. And blessed is he who is coming in the name of the Lord is applied to Jesus, the Messiah, who came in the name of the Lord. So the people on Palm Sunday are applying a Jewish ritual directed at God in the temple. Save us, save us, Hosanna, Hosanna, shaking. They're applying it right to Jesus. You are the Savior. You are the one God has sent. Uh, most of the phrase is, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Uh, Luke quotes it as, blessed is the king. The other gospels have, blessed is he who is coming. This one's blessed is the king who is coming, which uh, could be that some in the crowd were modifying a little bit. Blessed is the king who is coming. It also could be... Uh, Luke's inspired interpretation of the words, blessed is the king who is coming. And Zechariah had said that the king would come to Jerusalem riding on a donkey. So people in the crowd were calling him king or else Luke is modifying it to fit Zechariah 9.9 that the king is coming riding on a donkey. Now, they're all excited here and waving those palms, which is a true historical, cultural way of doing it. We don't do it, but they were used to doing it every year. So, uh, they are praising God for his uh, past miracles. You see verse 37. 
all the miracles which they had seen. Well, let's make a big long list, but let's put Lazarus in there. Because in terms of the miracles he did last, that would be Lazarus. And in terms of people coming to Jerusalem for Palm Sunday, that would be in their minds the resurrection of Lazarus. John uh, chapter 12 specifically says they came to see Jesus, but not only Jesus, they came to see Lazarus who was risen from the dead. Now, that really is a, that really is a fascinating claim that uh, Lazarus was in the cemetery, but now he's on the parade route. And the reason so many people came to Jerusalem was to see Lazarus. Now, if you put that in a book, it's either true or it's not true. But if it's not true, everybody knows it. I mean, everybody knew whether Lazarus was on the Palm Sunday parade or not. They all knew it. So uh, no one seemed to have debated that. And Lazarus was in town after his own funeral. And we have a John 12, 9, that people were coming to see Lazarus. John 12, 17, the witnesses who had seen Lazarus cried out, and they were testifying that Jesus could raise the dead. So when we picture Palm Sunday, we think of a donkey, and it behaves, not supposed to, kind of like this is almost impossible, and it's going down through here. And you have people yelling, we were at the cemetery, we saw him. And Lazarus is in town. He's over here. He was dead. Now he's over here. How do you put that in a book if it were not true without the whole book being discredited? But then it is true, and then you have Jesus raising Lazarus. That's part of the reason the crowds were so big, to see Jesus, but they're also wanting to see Lazarus. And you'd have to include that here in all the miracles which they had seen and heard. So these people are applying words to God, save us, save us, save us. They're applying these words to Jesus. Jesus is the Savior. Jesus has the power of God. Jesus speaks for God. And of course, the critics don't like it one bit. And then now we continue in uh, verse 39. Some of the Pharisees of the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus said to them, If I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. Moses said in Deuteronomy 6, 19, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Well, they are crying Hosanna to Jesus. Lord, save us. Lord, save us. Lord, save us. That's what they had typically applied to God in the temple, to ceremony. They're saying Jesus has the power of God. Jesus speaks for God. Jesus can save us. And the critics, not, tell them to shut up. Tell them to be quiet. And uh, Jesus would not stop their praise not stop their conclusion that he actually is a God and has the power of God. Uh, if we were to stop, the stones would cry out. So uh, Lazarus was the great miracle, but we can't stop their conclusions from Lazarus also being in town on the parade route. And uh, if we tried to stop it, the stones would give equal praise. Now, it seems here that there is a turn on the parade route. I can't remember. I've walked down that path before, and you kind of look for things, but there's like a little ridge going, going north, a little ridge, can't see the town, and then you turn and see the town that goes down. So it seems like Jesus is going to Jerusalem, but he can't quite see the city lights as we would say, can't quite have a city view, but then he turns. And when he turns, Luke adds, he starts to cry and says they do not know the day. So let's go ahead and read about that. When he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city 
which I think there was a turn here, and wept over it, saying, If you had known in this day, even you the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround and hem you in on every side. And they will level you to the ground and your children within you. They will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. So, I think only Luke catches that Jesus was crying. He's crying actually before they got to town. He was crying on the parade route. And you had all these people praising him, and it looked like a welcome, but the elite weren't going to welcome him. They had already decided with Caiaphas, this guy does a lot of miracles, everybody's going to believe on him, and you know, the solution to this is to put him to death. And they were already looking to put him to death. Uh, they did not know the day. Now, in a general sense, they did not know it was the day of the Messiah's coming. And uh, okay, in a general sense, they didn't catch it, as we would say it. On the other hand, it very well could be, and there's an argument that this is the day when Daniel's weeks run out. The 70th week of Daniel's sevens is the tribulation. The 69 seven are years after they're going to rebuild the city until the Messiah comes. And Daniel specifically says that when the time runs out, the Messiah will be cut off and the temple destroyed. So uh, we can look at this that Harold Honer is the chronology book I like the best. I remember seeing him a time or two. I remember calling him on the phone from here. Uh, I didn't print his chart because when I called him, he said, why are you calling me to print? Print anything you want. So in the past, we've printed it. We can do the gun if you like. But from the decree to rebuild Jerusalem way back in like the Ezra and Nehemiah days, you had 483 years and you use a Jewish time of year and it ends on March 30th. And Harold Honer says that when Jesus said, you do not know the day, it meant you don't know the day when the prophecy ran out. You don't know the day when the Messiah would be here, according to Daniel, and be cut off. So Jesus is thinking, you don't know the day in general that the king has come, but maybe specifically, you don't know the day that Daniel's 69 weeks of years cuts off right here. I mean, it was a, given a prophecy 500 years in advance, and it cuts off right on this day, right on March 30th, and uh, nobody's going to catch it. And Jesus knows at the end of the week he will die on the cross, which is probably April 3rd. Uh, following Harold Honer, chronological aspects of the life of Christ. So he was doing the impossible, riding a donkey, never been ridden, fulfilling a prophecy, but he was also uh, fulfilling the exact day when that prediction of his coming runs out to the exact time, which cannot be artificially fulfilled and is really an amazing thing, 500 years in advance. And later, Jesus knew that he would suffer on the cross. And then Daniel said, they're going to come and destroy the temple. They're going to destroy it again after the Messiah is here. Uh, and the prediction is Jesus is following Daniel and that not one stone will be left upon another. So even though he was very welcomed by a lot of the people, he was hated by the system. And he knew that this was the day when the time ran out, and this is the day when they would reject him, and he would suffer, but then the city would be destroyed. From uh, Palm Sunday story, we see it fits historically. They did cut all these palms, and they did wave them around. We just wouldn't think that, but 
They did temple ceremonies where they would wave palms around and ask God to save them. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they were not looking at the temple when they did this. They were looking right at Jesus and applying a uh, habits to God. They were applying it to Jesus. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We will find that whatever he says to you, we should do it. That we will find it just as he has told us. Uh, as when they looked for the donkey, we will find uh, fulfilled prophecies, really weird, riding an untrained donkey, which is uh, difficult enough. And then the day probably ran right out. You have 483 years of days, and it probably ran out March 30th, AD 33, according to Harold Honer. And Jesus knew that they were going to kill him, and there wouldn't be one stone left upon another. Well, in our story, Jesus made it to Jerusalem, and this is Sunday, and now we do the other days of the week, uh, the last week of his public ministry on earth. Will the musicians please come?